Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone. This is Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm your host today for the Global Fluency Podcast. I'm delighted to have with us a special guest, Joel Malbranch, and he is going to be talking to us um, specifically about language, his work with NGOs. And so, Joel, I want you to say hi to our guest. Welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you for being on. And so I'm going to share a little information about you with our listeners. So um, Joel has experience working in and implementing um, humanitarian projects throughout Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. He worked in the central plateau of Haiti post-earthquake and during the cholera epidemic. Joel has experience in program management, partner coordination, and radio hosting and production. He is also of Haitian descent and is fluent in French and Haitian Creole. He obtained his bachelor's degree in international relations and French from Connecticut College and holds a master's in international affairs from the new school. So, Joel, say hello to our guest and, and tell us a bit more about yourself and the work that you do. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction, Bertine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the bio is kind of the very much generic version of who I am. Uh, I think uh, the thing I like to talk about is I'm from Queens, New York, and of Haitian descent, and I think that that background has really shaped uh, who I am as a man today. It shaped uh, not just me personally, but also my career, uh, being exposed to different cultures since as far as I can remember, not just my own, but you know, my best friends are from the Philippines, they're from Eritrea, they're from Puerto Rico, so I always, from India, so I've always had literally different flavors and different languages and different smells um, in my life at all times. And I try to take that everywhere I go. All right. So I'm going to, for full transparency's sake, I'm going to let our listeners in on, on a little secret of we are friends of your sister, <laughs> one of my dearest friends. So I'm particularly delighted to have you on the show um, as also um, someone who shares your background, uh, being Haitian American, being multilingual, being from Queens, New York, best place on the planet. Um, <laughs> best place ever. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and really sharing that that sort of, that's, that diversity in Haitian-ness, being that we're both Haitian American and we're raised um, with a, a very Haitian-centric way of being. And so what that means to live in America, what that means when you travel abroad, um, what lessons you, you learn along the way. And, and then that other layer of diversity being raised in Queens, which is just this amazing um, mixed salad. This is how I tend to think of Queens, rather than a melting pot, which, you know, <laughs> everybody melts into this one gelatinous thing, you know, um, in Queens, it, it's the individual that stands out. And I love that because you can all be in there together. And really, um, that's what makes this wonderful meal. Now, of course, I use that analogy because I'm a foodie and in Queens, uh, <laughs> I can't turn left or right without seeing some sort of different kind of food. And, and really, I think that that has shaped um, all of us kids from Queens, quite honestly. Uh, I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's made us live locally, of course, but also be citizens of the world at the same time, which is great when you're young and in college and on a very tight budget. So, <laughs> <laughs> so having said that, tell me about the work that you do currently and what you've done before. Sure. 
So in general, my background is uh, in international development. And uh, currently I work for an organization called Internews, uh, where we work with journalists across the world. Um, we train them, uh, we help refurbish existing mechanisms within uh, the countries that we operate in. I uh, manage our Africa portfolio. Um, so we work with journalists locally. Uh, right now that we live in a world of misinformation, uh, we make sure that they fact check their information. Uh, we make sure that they don't use inflammatory languages in talking about any issues from politics to social issues. We also give platform to those who are marginalized and unfortunately in this world, marginalization, um, well, in my world in terms of international development, it means uh, women and youth. So we wanna make sure that they have their voices heard as well, especially in times of, of elections and politics that, are, that seem to always be happening uh, across the continent of Africa where I currently focus now. Um, this work has enabled me to visit parts of the world that I've always wanted to, uh, even Haiti. There, when I was working in Haiti, I would have never gone to the Central Plateau on my own, and I got to see a whole new side of Haiti, aside from uh, the beaches and uh, Pizza Garden, if I joke. <laughs> Don't knock Pizza Garden. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's delicious. <laughs> um, but I really feel like Haiti was a training ground for me, and everything that's been thrown at me on the wonderful continent of Africa, I've been like, I've seen this before and um, I, I, I can make this work. So, I mean, I think that's kind of why I went towards this type of profession is just to be always exposed to diversity, always, always exposed to newness, um, being able to use my natural skill set, which is language and adaptation to different cultures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I love that you were talking about the um, Haitian plateau, the central Haitian plateau. And so that is definitely not tourist Haiti, right? No, it should be, it can be, but as of now, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> as of now, but that doesn't mean that that won't change. But I do love being able to experience a country, um, you know, that is our country as well as the United States, of course, but experience that other side of us, of our heritage, but in a way that we've never been able to see before. You know, and one thing I know for sure, um, and I know this about you as well, um, growing up, our families ensured that we did return to Haiti, that we mm -hmm. were, you know, ensconced in the culture, the language, the people, um, because it was important for us to have as our foundation living here in America, right? But to see Haiti in a very different light, to see Haiti as, as a non-tourist um, that had to be impactful um, in, in a major way. And I just, I remember just, seeing parts of Haiti myself that I wouldn't have gone to um, because I, I didn't even know that they existed. I just thought Haiti was what my family took me to, right? right. And so how did that, how did seeing the, the Central Plateau, how did that change your perception of Haiti and your own Haitian-ness? I mean, it changed it in a lot of ways, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, I think it, when you when you're in Haiti and you're in the capital or you see it on the news, uh, the only things the only issues you're exposed to are really political issues. Obviously, you know they talk about poverty as well, but it made me think more about the environment. Um, it made me think about life outside of a capital city. I think everywhere we, you know, I'll speak for myself. Everywhere I've been, where I've lived, has always been in a major city. Currently, I'm in Washington D.C. I grew up in. In, in New York City, while it's not the capital of New York, it's still, you know, it feels like the capital. Um, I lived in Nairobi, Kenya, you know, but you really see kind of what the, the best the, the country has to offer um, or the state has to offer. But when you're outside of that, you see a whole new, a whole new set of issues, but a whole new uh, potential, side of potential as well. But it also challenged me because it was just a totally, totally new experience and something that I would gear myself towards if I were in another country, but not my own. Mm. You know, having to, you know, deal with, you know, I got malaria in Haiti. I was like, how am I? I'm from here. Well, this is Haitian. Oh, no. Yeah, but <laughs> mosquitoes didn't care. Um, and so dealing with it, they you know. are the best for diversity <laughs> and inclusion. <laughs> Wow. They don't discriminate, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but in another great way, you know, I got eight different types of Haitian food that I never would have ate before. You know, bouillon tête cabri for your for your listeners. That's the literal translation is goat head soup, and it's become one of my favorite things to eat. Um, 
getting different stories, different realities, but what's important is hearing them in a language that you understand, which is to me so powerful, which is why I, I try to encourage anyone who's living in a new country or, or not just to learn another language, just so you can continue to have those conversations. Absolutely, absolutely. So since we were talking about um, your visit to Haiti and you know how it, it kind of expanded your, your ethnicity, if you will, mm -hmm. So being that ethnicity is only one component of diversity, um, as is race and, and a bunch of other things, part of the purpose of this podcast and of my mission, um, at this, which is what it's become at this point, um, is to go against the traditional diversity and inclusion paradigm that only focuses you know, on a couple of components of diversity. So I, I'm intending with, with this podcast to you know, look at every possible component of diversity that exists and that's going to hopefully continue changing over time but with regard to you visiting africa and living having lived in different countries in africa um i i'll share my my just my personal thought on this is i i always get frustrated when people ask about the black experience because it's not monolithic right mm -hmm. and being that africa has what 52 countries um the experience of being African and Africanness differs with each country that you go to. Absolutely. So how did you going back to the different countries that you went to in Africa, how did that um, change your view of your own blackness uh, or add to it? Like how did that affect you? Well, it made me appreciate the diversity of, of, of black people in general. Um, I think too many people, just think, just talk about Africa, that it's just kind of one big country. But, you know, the people in Kenya and the people of, you know, Mali, for example, are completely different. The people of Tanzania and the people of Kenya, again, are completely different. It's just, you know, they're on the same continent, but they're different countries, different traditions, different languages, different foods, different reactions to things. So, it really made me appreciate this. Uh, one time I was on a flight, uh, Ethiopian Airways flight, and we landed in Addis, and there was like a, a bit of a fight in the, when people were trying to rush to get off the plane, and a bit of a fight broke out. You had the reaction of an Ethiopian man, a Nigerian man, um, an Indian man, uh, another, another woman from Burkina Faso, and they just all reacted in their respective ways. And to me, it was like, this is perfect. Everyone is, you know, you know, mad or, or saying whatever curse words in their own language. And it was just kind of, for me, it was just like, this is so interesting to me. It's just everyone thinks that, not everyone, I shouldn't say that, but many people like to think that, you know, Africans are the same. You know, they don't think Europeans are the same. Americans aren't the same, you know, as you... You being from Queens and now living in Atlanta, I'm sure you could uh, say that the people are <laughs> completely different. Now more than um, ever. Now more than ever. <laughs> but I just appreciate the you know the differences, the different cultures, um, and the, how everyone is unique, even in the way they look. For Christ's sake, you know, East Africans look very different than Central Africans or, or West Africans. <laughs> Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. So yeah, it made me appreciate that a lot more. But at the same time, there is something that does unite us. Um, I can't say what that is. Maybe it's just a comfort level that I have now when I travel. Um, 
and yeah, I mean, I really appreciate those experiences that I had. Very cool, very cool. I love the um, visual that that evoked, just trying to picture everybody, um, all of these different people from varying African countries on the plane. Fighting, <laughs> verbal, well, you know, not fighting, but just in disagreement of who should leave the plane first. I like that one, in disagreement, because it also is something that um, many, many people can relate to who have never been to those countries, because I can say, um, you know, for certain airlines that shall not be named, um, <laughs> you know, when you're trying to get from one, you know, connection to another, you all want off the plane and everybody does respond differently. So the Midwesterners, for instance, um, might respond differently than the New Yorkers and right. the, you know, Californians. And I, you know, as a proud New Yorker and now, you know, proud Southern Belle of Atlanta, um, <laughs> I'm an adopted Southern Belle because I still keep my New York cell phone number. Never hear you. Up. <laughs> Never, ever, ever, ever. No, the 347 forever. <laughs> but um, having said that, you know, I, I definitely look at people and think, wow, you know, this is insane to me that they do respond so differently. And then having people also make assumptions about um, me, for instance, um, I'm told oftentimes I don't sound like a New Yorker. Um, mm -hmm. I don't say hot dog. And eh? like, well, my mom <laughs> would have had just, you know, a coronary over that because <laughs> she, she was very much about speaking proper English. But then don't New Yorkers, of course, but then someone else says, you sound like you're from California. And I'm thinking, what does that even sound like, right? Right. So I, I definitely love the visual, though, of all of these people who are so very different with the same goal, right? So that that is kind of funny to me. I'm going to laugh at that for a minute. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you then, um, how has being multilingual expanded your reach and benefited you on both a personal and professional level? Well, uh, being multilingual has really <laughs> been such a huge help. And I, I thank my parents all the time. Um, because I grew up in a trilingual household, you know, obviously, just like your mother, uh, my parents made sure that my sister and I, you know, spoke proper English, uh, but they also spoke to us in French. And when, whenever we got in trouble, they spoke to us in Creole. They That's came out quick. Yeah, That's when it got real. <laughs> Stop like, being nice and start getting real. Um, but all three languages have played a huge role in, in my career, to tell you the truth. Um, just being able to to speak French, for example, has opened so many doors for me. It's really been the ticket for me to travel um, many parts of Africa. Um, it's helped me get many jobs. Just being able to, you know, talk to your interviewer in French, let them know, like, hey, I'm not playing games. Like, this is, <laughs> I, I speak this. Um, and also just, you know, I've tried to learn, you know, Spanish. I, I, I know a little bit of Portuguese, but... French really helped that because all these romance languages kind of have a lot of things in, in cult, um, in, have a lot of things in, in uh, that are the same in terms of rules. Um, being able to hear if someone's talking about you. One time, I was at an all you can eat Pizza Hut with. Uh, no story yeah. starts out well that way. I know, no right? I know it, it, it ends well, but um, <laughs> and there were two Haitian men talking about uh, me and my friend and his his uh, his, his parents. Who you know, we kept eating. It was all you can eat pizza, and I hear them talking about us. And I waited all the way until the end to tell oh them that I understood. Gosh. And they, you know, their mouths dropped. Um, just anyway, people, you know, just being able, it could be as simple as being able to help someone who's lost in yeah. the street. How do you get to, you know, 42nd in Madison? You know, you tell them in French or Creole or whatever to go this way, to go that way. So it's just open, not just career doors, but also just friendship doors uh, for me on a personal level. So, um, and, and I, I don't plan on stopping with just that. When I was, when I was living in Kenya, I, I took two years of Swahili. And even though I'm at, I would say I'm at a fourth grade level, so okay. I had, you can talk I, to the fourth graders. That exactly. And I could, you know, ask where the bathroom is. I could exactly. order food. But I just think it's just learning more languages in general. You know, when I have kids, I, I want to make sure that they speak as many languages as possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. I you, I feel like you were describing my reality minus, you know, the whole <laughs> buffet. But... <laughs> It was a long time ago, though. Now I probably wouldn't, you know, it was last week. I wouldn't make it. <laughs> That's okay. I won't blow you up out there. But <laughs> listeners, it was a long time ago. <laughs> but um, I definitely think, and, and I agree with you, that uh, multilinguicity, I've always said, is a gift. But growing up as, um, as kids of immigrants, um, I didn't always see it as such. And I didn't appreciate it till I started, you know. <laughs> 
getting into the workforce and, and things like that. I really used to resent it growing up. Um, and now I couldn't imagine a world without it. And, and being a parent now, I raised my child to also um, be multilingual because I was just like, well, you have to speak whatever languages me and your dad speaks. And you know, too bad for you. You'll thank me later. <laughs> you thank you. He will thank you later. I promise. He better, but I definitely think he will. I definitely think he will. Um, but but you know, what's that saying that um, Nelson Mandela said? If you speak to someone in a language they understand, you speak to their brain. If you speak to them in their own language, you speak to their hearts. You know, and I definitely um, I recall many times being on the streets of New York where somebody was lost. Uh, again, a familiar image to me where the person is, you know, asking you something, you recognize the accents um, because a Haitian Creole accent is very particular. A I could pick it out, pick it out in a crowd of 30,000. Right? Exactly. It, like it, you can pick it out at Grand Central during rush hour, right? <laughs> like, that's how distinctive it is. And so when, when you know, when you respond to somebody in Haitian Creole, uh, the look on their face, it, they light up and they're like, my friend, and yeah. you know, then it, it, it really becomes something amazing. I remember one time um, I was in Aruba and I, I met um, a woman who was um, Dominican. And so I, I just gave her a greeting in Spanish and she, she looked like she was gonna fall over and she was like, hello, you know? And then the same time um, I met a, a couple of women who were Haitian and I heard them speaking Creole and I turned around and, and just gave them another greeting in Creole and they too looked like they were just knocked over and they were so happy and they were like, oh my gosh. And to my surprise, I didn't know Dominicans and Haitians were living and working in Aruba that there were so many of them in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was like a learning experience for me. And they were just so wonderful. I'm like, you need to come back here. I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> for many reasons. But now that I met you, yes, indeed. You know, um, but that's me plugging in for vacation time. <laughs> but um, having said that, then, um, you and I, um, we were exchanging um, some messages about, you know, language and, and you know, using a national language. So um, with regard to language and the dissemination of language, um, based on your experiences, should countries disseminate information in a national language or in a local vernacular? Because that can be, you know, being that your, your position right now is to, um, to empower journalists to spread mm -hmm. factual information. And, that that information has to be given in in a form that's palatable to the people they're giving the information to so what are your thoughts on this um i think it should be given to in all languages um in many of the countries that uh i i work in or we work in uh, we have a news bulletin we have it in as many languages as we can so it could be in a national language and at least two vernacular languages. So the vernacular languages always uh, outweigh the local, I mean, the national language, excuse me. Um, as you said, it's very important that everyone understands the pertinent information you're trying to give out. So if you're giving information about anything health related, you want people to understand. Um, and I definitely think that the vernacular language should uh, uh, take priority over the national language. Um, furthermore, in certain countries, I'll speak of Haiti, and this is, you know, I'm only speaking for myself. I definitely think that Creole should be, uh, should take precedence over French. I mean, French is, Wikipedia in Haiti, I think the national language is French and Creole, but I think it should be Creole and then French, and even English, uh, because for me, I'm not a, an average Haitian, uh, meaning, you know, i I come from a family with means, uh, by means saying that my parents were able to put a roof over my head and, you know, pay for my high schooling. College, I was, I was on my own, but high schooling, they, they paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was half, half parents, half Sally, May. But, um, I just think that if uh, an average Haitian um, who speaks French, what kind of comparative advantage does that give them? Uh, they only can get a job in Haiti uh, but their the, their neighbor to the right to, of them, so I guess that would be to the west, um, the east. Excuse me. They speak Spanish, and the country surrounding them speak Spanish. And then you have the U.S. in the north, where there's English. I just think that countries in general should look at what language gives their people a comparative advantage. Uh, you have Rwanda, for example, that uh, was speaking French, and then uh, Paul Kagame, their president, has changed that to English. Because if you look around the countries that surround them, the majority of them speak English. Uh, 
uh, with the exception to the DRC and brewing beef. But um, I'm all about giving people an advantage to, to better themselves and understand information. Sorry for that long-winded answer. No, it's a podcast. That's what we like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I definitely appreciate that perspective um, because like you raised speaking French and Creole, um, literally, even though I was born here, French was my first language. Um, mm -hmm. I left the U.S. when I was two months old, came back when I was two years old. And in Haiti, um, you're in school, literally, if you have the means to go to school, you're in right. school earlier and you're in school longer um, than you are in the United States. So that's big fun on another <laughs> note. But um, having said that, I couldn't start kindergarten in the U.S. until I was five. And in Haiti, you are in kindergarten at that age, you know. Right. And so I guess it's com comparatively speaking, it's it's nursery school, but it's still, you know, it's rigorous. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you're expected to know your ABCs and all that good stuff. Right. So when I came here, I, I literally had to wait three years before going to school. So um, to add to that, my babysitters, my very first ones were Cuban and Colombian. So mm. my world as an American consisted of everything but English. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How do you grow up as an American who doesn't speak English? And my answer is like this, you know, right. um, and then you show a picture of yourself or something. <laughs> but, you know, I, I always thought, you know, I was really fortunate in that sense. And, and you know, we really are because we are we are given mobility. Um, multilinguicity is a gift and it allows you to go someplace and speak to people in a language that is their language. Right. Um, so I, I always used to say I never get lost um, in the Bronx never going to get lost in Queens, you know, because right. you speak to somebody about something, you know. Um, but with regard to that, um, I do like what you were saying about um, changing the national language, because mm. it is, I'm a, I'm a fan of French, um, I, but I do believe as a Haitian American person, it is our adopted language. And right. so, you know, Creole is our, you know, c'est la native natale nous. It's exactly our non-Creole speaking um, listeners out there, it's our, it's our native language, you know, but, but when you say it in Creole, it's got kind of a deeper meaning than that, right? Um, but it, it's, so French is our adopted language, but we have to think about our population um, and how a majority of Haitian people do not speak French, but they speak Haitian Creole. And of course, there are, there are reasons tied to that, you know, colonization, um, upward mobility, um, you know, certain advantages that, that keep a majority of the people outside of that area of success that they can reach. Uh, it keeps them localized and it doesn't allow them the freedom that they would necessarily have if they speak French as well. So I think, Absolutely. you know, it's kind of cutting people off at the knees and not giving them um, a fair advantage. So. I am a fan of um, um, Creole being the, the primary um, language in Haiti. I'm hoping that as the tide has turned more towards Creolism, as the movement has, has progressed, um, I see that people you know, of our generation, so that's basically um, the, gen, the Gen Xers, the Millennials, and even the Gen Zs are starting to see that this is something that, that has value. This is something that will empower not only people, but a country. You know? mm -hmm. English should be as well, um, only because that will allow people to have some mobility, you know. Um, and I think in a country like the United States, for instance, where there is no official language, you know, but the unofficial one is English, um, that works to our advantage because we're able to, you know, we're able to go to different parts. Like if you and I decided to move to different states, we would still be able to work in this country. And so with Haiti, I, I think it's really important um, to consider, especially in light of the examples that you gave with regard to Burundi and the other countries that you mentioned. So right. there's another long-winded part. Um, <laughs> right, it's a whole other podcast. Yeah, it's a whole other podcast. So then um, this brings me to my next question. So having worked abroad for the past several years, are there any experiences that have further shaped your views on diversity and inclusion here in America? Oh, I mean that yes. So I think we, there needs to be more of it in America. I, I think I think in, in a lot of major cities we see the diversity changing. It's becoming a bit less diverse with especially with gentrification. Mm -hmm. uh, before I left for Kenya, uh, I was living in 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 New York in Brooklyn, and just you know I've been living in Brooklyn. I, I was living in Brooklyn for about ten years, and just. Seeing that change in 10 years, because, you know, I, I was a foreigner to Brooklyn, you know, even though I am a New Yorker, Brooklyn is different than Queens. 
um, and seeing it be um, less black, less what it was, uh, and then leaving and then coming back um, and then moving to Kenya. So moving to Africa, moving to Kenya, working with Kenyans and even Kenyans within themselves are diverse. They have different tribes, um, different local languages as well. And then coming back to Washington, D.C., which is really a huge culture shock. Um, yeah. You're and so it took me. Talked about that. Oh like, boy! He comes back. <laughs> it would be so different for him. Very different, and you know I'm used to it now, and I'm used to it because you know to be to be quite honest, after high school, college, and then the jobs that I have had, I was always one of the few black men mm -hmm. in the building, or or the black. Well, or the blog, going to a bar, you know, you look up automatically, it's the first thing I kind of pay attention to. So coming from Africa, <laughs> and <laughs> Kenya, and then coming to DC, which is used to be known as Chocolate City, but ain't chocolate no more, it's white chocolate. Oh, um, dude. That's so um, with sprinkles of chocolate chip. But um, it definitely was a culture shock. So for me, it's my experience is abroad have solidified the fact that wherever I live, I need to be in a diverse area. I, so, which is how I grew up to tell you the truth. It's nothing new. It's not, it's not something, you know, this, this new revelation shouldn't shock the system. It's something that I've always been a part of. But when you come out of that and then you're thrown back here into it where it's not that, it's, it's a shock. And you appreciate the past of kind of where you lived and when it was very diverse. So, for me, long story short, for me, um, I think my experiences abroad made me realize how diversity in all of it, all of its roots, whether it's cultural, racial, spiritual, um, I want different foods, I want everything. <laughs> um, maybe I'm because I'm spoiled uh, how I grew up, but it's very very important to me. I, I, I completely understand. Um, you took me through my own odyssey for a second mm -hmm. uh, because coming down here to Atlanta, um, in New York, because my, my maiden name is, is Crevacore, um, people kind of knew. They were like, oh, you must be from Haiti, right? Um, and <laughs> rarely they would say, you must be French. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm actually Haitian, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, when I come down here to Atlanta, when I, I first moved down here, everybody kept asking me, am I Creole? And I was like, why? I'm Haitian, you know, like, duh, Crevacore. And then, you know, it smacked me um, in the forehead. You know, Louisiana is right here, right. you know, basically. And that is why people would make that assumption. And I thought to myself, I had never even thought about that. So even my own idea of um, the South was challenged because I was spoiled in, in New York. I was spoiled in Queens. And so when we moved down here, we sought to live in an area that was just as diverse. And I thought, how is that even going to happen? And then I come to find out that there's so much diversity, you know, in, in some parts of Georgia, in some parts of Georgia, which is great to see. You know, it, it really, like, I don't have to travel far for, you know, Korean food or Indian food. And, and again, it's all food, which I yeah. love. So I'm not mad at that, you know? It brings us together. Exactly. So it worked out for me. But, you know, that's only, and I think that was honestly by chance uh, or divine intervention. But, you know, if we want to go to, you know, um, the Hindu temple, there's, there's this ginormous Hindu temple literally 10 minutes away, which I never even conceived I would find here in mm -hmm. Atlanta. Like that blew my mind. So I think, you know, even as somebody that's considered a subject matter expert in diversity, um, there's still stuff that I'm learning all the time. And, and I'm so thrilled with that journey, you know, and I, I would equate that to when you went over to Africa and you were visiting these different countries and living there. So visiting is one thing, but I think living there, um, that's just a daily dose of diversity, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Just the way how people, people operate. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I just think that, that. I, I love how that has shaped you um, to do the work that you're doing here, you know, and to continue to, to have that conversation with countless people. I think it's very empowering. So in conclusion, what are the two things you'd like to impart upon our listeners? Like if you had to tell them two things, what would that be? Um, travel. I think it's important. And when I say travel, don't, you know, don't do the resort package. You do the resort package. Let's say you're going on a week trip, maybe do the resort for three days and then get out and explore. 
Um, you know, the world is bigger than uh, the city that you live in. I, I really believe that. And even if you, if you have listeners who are abroad, who, who live in another country, I still tell them to travel. I think it's really important just to see how other people live. Um, I also think it's important to uh, learn another language. Um, there are so many ways you can do it now. There are books on tape. Even watching television with, uh, if you watch Netflix and you put on closed captioning in Spanish, I think it's really important. Uh, I think just opening those doors to have conversations with people who don't speak the same language as you, to be able to understand each other is is really important. There are apps, there are apps where you can, you know, meet with people online and if you want to practice the the, you know, the, the poor Spanish you speak or the, the, the embarrassing French you speak, just go ahead and do it. Uh, because fourth, I think fourth grade Swahili. Fourth grade Swahili, there you go. Uh, I, I think it's really important because it'll, it'll help you on so many different levels like it's helped me. Awesome, awesome. So if people, let's say, um, because we do have lots of different people listening to um, the podcast. So if journalists want to reach out to you, if people that are interested in diversity and inclusion or the work that you do with NGOs want to reach out to you, where can they find you? Um, you can find me on Twitter at um, Joey25, J-O-W-A-Y 25. Um, also, I also have a podcast, so shameless plug. It's uh, the oh, Global right. Citizen, the Global Citizen podcast. Um, you can check me out there. Those are really the two best ways to to, to find me, and then from there we can we can have a, a longer chat. Awesome. So, on a personal note, as someone that's known you since the ripe old age of nine, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show, and I'm so proud of you and and really all the work that that you are doing. It's important. It's amazing. It's necessary. Um. So, thank you for taking the time out of your super busy workday to be on Global Fluency Podcast. I can't wait to air this episode. Um. And I will tell your sister and your parents. Um. <laughs> Thank you for being on the show. And, you know, for our listeners out there, I hope this this episode resonates with you just like it has resonated with me. And I encourage you to continue um, the conversation. So until next time, this is Bertine Prevacore West. I'm thanking our esteemed guest, Joelle Malblanche, uh, for being on our show today. And we will see you on the next episode. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.